Okay, welcome. Welcome all from the campus of Gonzaga. Welcome to our panelists and our faculty and students and all of our guests, including alums, friends, and other students as we explore the transformative power of the arts and humanities today with our colleagues from the College of Arts and Sciences and some of our wonderful students. My name is Jeff Galdin. I'm Assistant Vice President of Academic Development and University Advancement. I have the great pleasure of working with our Dean Anne-Marie Cano and the college, as well as our staff, faculty, and students. I'm also a double zag myself, so pleased to be part of this uh, opportunity today. It, today will prove to be a great hour that we have to spend with our Dean and our panelists exploring the importance of this transformative power of the arts and humanities, which is at the core of what Gonzaga offers through our educational experience. The college is our core. Every student goes through the college and has experience with our curriculum in this way. Uh, we are pleased to have spend an hour together. Uh, a couple of housekeeping details. This is being recorded, uh, just so everyone is aware. Also, if you have questions along the way, we encourage them. Please do not hesitate and drop them, please, in the chat box, and we will try to get to them as we go through the hour. Um, if we can't get to a question for some reason, we'll do our best to respond to you post-event and uh, get back and, and try to fulfill all those requests. So to start us off, um, Anne-Marie, our Dean Anne-Marie Cano will lead the way, but I wanted to provide a brief introduction for Dean Cano uh, so that everybody understands who she is and um, what kind of role she's filling for Gonzaga. Dr. Cano is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and a professor of psychology at Gonzaga University. Her work as a leader is informed by personal experience and a research career covering chronic pain and illness, empathy, and emotional regulation and diversity and inclusion topics. She has over 70 publications, has served as principal investigator in four national institutes of health grants, and is a fellow of the American Psychological Association in two divisions, Society for Health Psychology and Society for Couple and Family Psychology. Dr. Connor also curates and edits public scholarship as an editorial board member of the National Center for Institutional Diversity Sparks Magazine. A Latina and a first-generation college student, Dr. Cano earned her master's and doctoral degrees in psychology from Stony Brook University and her bachelor's degree in psychology from Princeton University. In 2010, she completed the Ignatian Spirituality Internship at Manresa Jesuit Retreat House in Michigan with a specialty in spiritual direction and Ignatian discernment. Dr. Cano is in her second, or excuse me, her first year as dean of the college probably seems like a lot more than that after this year of the pandemic. Uh, she enjoys exploring Spokane in the Northwest with her husband and son. And I will, before I turn this over, I also wanna say one thing. I wanna send a big thank you to our faculty. Uh, it's been quite a year. The resilience that you showed this year, along with of course our students is quite remarkable. You know, a year ago at this time, we had no idea what this was gonna look like, but we are so pleased to know the strength that you all showed to provide the educational experience for our students. It is noted and certainly not overlooked. So tilted the hat to our faculty on this call, as well as all of those out there who might be joining us. So without further ado, Anne-Marie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate the warm welcome. And thank you to everyone who's here today. So both to our panelists and to our attendees. Um, so you might be wondering what, you know, Here's a psychology professor who's a dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and what are the humanities and what are the arts? Um, and that's a pretty common question that I often get in, in terms of like, what is the College of Arts and Sciences? And um, it's a lot, um, as as Jeff was mentioning. But let me give you a brief overview of how I look at the arts and sciences and why I think arts and humanities are such a core central piece of the college. Um, and and have has so much to bring. And then we're gonna have a conversation with faculty and students who are right in the thick of it um, doing this work. And I hope that um, if you have questions, please feel free to post in the chat and we will get to your questions as we go on. Um, and all right, so let's get started. So 
The college, as Jeff mentioned, is home to a variety of liberal arts fields and, and STEM fields that form the foundation of our core curriculum at Gonzaga as a Jesuit, humanistic, and Catholic institution. And so most of the students pass through the college at some point and have contact with our faculty and the disciplines. And the arts and sciences disciplines very broadly ask some very basic, important questions that we have as human beings. So like, where are we in the universe? Like, literally, where are we in the universe? But what is our place in the universe? Um, what, why, why are we here? Um, what does it mean to be human? What's our purpose? And we ask those questions and answer them with different ways of knowing and different ways of asking, um, of finding knowledge. So we, we can do this at the atomic level, if you want to talk about physics, at um, mathematics level, um, at a biological or cellular level, at the individual level in psychology, which is my home field of study. Um, and then also at the society, uh, societal level. And so at, at every one of those levels, we're asking those basic questions. And so as a collective, the arts and sciences really address these, you know, what does it mean to be human? Um, and whether people are going into industry or the arts or service, uh, you know, wherever the students are going after they graduate, knowing how to approach those questions and how to be with people who are asking these questions to you, that's, those are really important skills to have. Unfortunately, you know, maybe the last 20 years or so, people have, have started to think, well, we don't really, art is nice to have, or, you know, um, great writing is nice to have, um, but it's not essential. And I would argue that it is essential. And if we, if anyone has learned anything over the last year and a half during the COVID um, pandemic, we have realized that we might have lost something by not looking at arts and humanities as central to who we are as human beings and how we connect with each other, how we understand each other. Um, and so uh, if there is a silver lining um, in terms of learning as a broad community, as a worldwide community that you know, we need all forms of knowledge, including arts and humanities to be able to survive and thrive as we move on from here. So arts and humanities, what departments are those? That typically would include um, the Department of Art, Classics, English, History, Modern Languages and Literature, Music, Philosophy, Religious Studies, Theater and Dance. And then sometimes there'll be professors in some of the other departments who take a humanities lens um, or an arts lens to their approaches. And that's kind of where I am and why I, I Another reason why I'm so keenly interested in arts and humanities is that I'm a psychologist, um, but I'm very interested in perspective taking and empathy and how we can really understand another person's point of view. And I have found that art, music, and literature are key ways to be able to understand or at least approach understanding of what someone else or an entire group might be going through. And I, I've learned a lot personally in my life from arts and humanities. And then I take it into my workplace or into family interactions. And so arts and humanities really is a broad field. We don't have enough time today to talk about every single one of those departments, but we do have representatives from the Department of Art and also the Department of English um, today to talk a little bit about their experiences. And so I'd, I'd like to now, um, have them introduce themselves. And so we can have a conversation and, and learn more about your, your experiences as panelists. And I I'd like to start with the faculty and have you each introduce yourself, um, what department you're in, maybe what some of the courses are that you teach and uh, how long you've been here at Gonzaga. I'm happy to go first, I'm unmuted. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Kanyo, um, for organizing this. I'm Shalon Parker. I'm the chair of the art department at Gonzaga. Um, I'm a professor of art history, actually, so I don't teach studio art, but I talk about art and its history. Um, I've been at Gonzaga for 19 years now, which is hard for me to believe. And um, in that time frame, I think I've taught about 10 different courses. And my most recent course is a 
course called Race and Art in the Americas, which I actually team teach with a colleague of mine in the English department, Dr. Jess Machone. So it's been a real highlight of uh, my career the last uh, couple of years to be able to offer that material. So um, that's my introduction and eager to hear what others have to say. I'll just go quickly and follow. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you to Dean Kanyo for organizing. Um, my name is Heather Easterling. I'm a professor of English in the English department. I, my field of specialty is Renaissance Lit. So I teach a lot of Shakespeare, Shakespearean drama, um, drama and poetry from the period of the early modern or the Renaissance. But um, one of the things I love the most about teaching at Gonzaga is that I have been enabled over 16 years here, which is how long I've been <clears throat> at GU. Um, I teach in my field, um, but I regularly get the chance to teach core courses where I teach studies in poetry, which is a wonderful, broader kind of survey poetry course. I get to teach um, some core courses to uh, first year students. Um, most recently, I've been collaborating with a colleague in communications and developing a course for first year seminar that asks questions in some ways, broad humanistic uh, arts and sciences questions, but using the lens of the American West. Um, so getting the chance to think about place um, as well as different ways of knowing, including the literary um, for asking some interesting questions. Um, so um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Easterling and Dr. Parker. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to the students to introduce yourselves and um, just as your professors did unmute yourself, um, but your question, the questions I like to ask you are a little different. So um, if you could, after you say your name, your um, hometown or, or what feels like a hometown, depending on how you feel about your hometown, um, your major or minors of study and um, maybe a favorite memory about your arts and humanities experience at Gonzaga or a fa favorite memory, because I know that there's more than one. Okay, I guess I'll go first because I also unmuted. Um, hi everyone, my name is Olivia Isarankura. Um, I just graduated from Gonzaga with a uh, bachelor's in arts. Um, I uh, am from Seattle, Washington, so I'll be moving back there actually later today, which is exciting. <laughs> um, but I think a really great memory, I mean, as a whole has been being able to take a wide variety of courses in the arts, not just studio art. And I think taking courses like um, art history with Dr. Parker and um, as well as even taking like my algebra class freshman year kind of it's a nice to have this well-rounded education so I can come out of this like knowing that um, I kind of got this really well um, rounded education, like I said, but just feeling way more prepared um, with everything that I learned here. So I think as a whole, that's my favorite. That's a good memory to take with me. <laughs> Thank you. I can go next. My name is Gabriela Marquis. Um, I just finished my first year here at Gonzaga. I am a English writing philosophy and Spanish major with a minor in music. And um, my hometown is Spokane. And my, I guess, favorite arts and humanities memory from this year was actually a project that I did with Garrick um, in a writing for social action class where we wrote a um, activist uh, comedy based on like the Daily Show kind of setup. And it was super fun to film and put together. Um, I think I can go next. Uh, my name is Tom. I am from Boulder, Colorado, actually. And I'm a senior, so I, I guess I'm not a senior anymore, just graduated. But um, I have a major in biology um, with the pre-med kind of track and then I'm minoring in chemistry and art and a favorite I guess maybe not so much a memory but something I just appreciate is I've had the chance like Olivia said to take a lot of a variety of different courses and one thing I'm really appreciative of is taking printmaking because um, it's kind of a really collaborative art form and it is really like material intensive and so having the resources that Gonzaga can provide and the instruction is just been completely incredible. And so that's something I'm really grateful for. Um, yeah, I can go. My name is Garrick Bateman. I'm from uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. 
I just finished my sophomore year here at Gonzaga. Um, and probably my favorite memory has been or experience was um, a writing digital content class I took uh, this year. Um, and I took it all online. I was uh, remote. Um, and I think just like the way that the course was updated for remote learning um, and the way it like the subject matter complemented some of those things that we were going through um, was really interesting and valuable to my education. Thank you. Thank you to all the students for introducing yourself and um, and a special congratulations to Olivia and Tom for for graduating um, this weekend. And if I had a reaction through Zoom, I'm so used to like, you know, you hit the, you know, the, um, I don't know, it's like confetti or something like that. I would do that for you if I could do that right now. <laughs> so great. Um, I think the attendees can probably hear that you know we have people with different majors and different um, different experiences moving through and taking courses and everyone has there's something that speaks to each one of you in a slightly different way um, and that arts and humanities is not just for arts and humanities majors right so that it's something that can um, round out and I don't know if uh, Dr. Easterling if I'm going to use this properly, but, you know, the, rena the, the prototypical Renaissance person, you know, being able to um, be able to speak well, write well, um, uh, engage in discussion, and also appreciate art, and also do art, and make art, or create things. And I think also with that, that so much of what you just described that we think of as the kind of quote unquote Renaissance person or Renaissance man, of course, was the stereotype, drew on the tradition of Renaissance humanism, which is an intellectual movement, but that nevertheless had a deep moral foundation to it. And I know one of the things that we were talking about in terms of this panel today was what is it that makes any of these pursuits, whether it's English or broadly humanities or arts, distinctive at Gonzaga, and I'm sure we're gonna go back to that too, but I, as you raise that, it just makes me think for myself, teaching literature in an institution like Gonzaga, I, I feel so re regularly that we draw on the sense of our Jesuit context um, and, and the notion that we take very seriously what it means to have intellectual virtues and that there's a moral quality to the work that we do and the thinking that we do and the questions that we ask, so. Thank you. That's great. So for the students, um, I'm curious, uh, did you did you know that um, you wanted to go into arts and humanities specifically? Did you find your way into it? Um, it's always interesting for people to hear how how students made their way through college. And we all have had experiences where we thought we were going to love something. We didn't love it quite so much, or we thought something was going to be challenging in a way, but it just drew us in. And so I, I wonder if any of you had experiences of how that you could talk about how you found your way into some of the arts and humanities courses or majors and minors that you did. I can, or I can go ahead and share if that's okay. Um, so luckily I studied quite a bit of art in high school, but going into college, I knew right away that I was going to pursue a degree in art. Um, I knew that just because I couldn't think of anything else I wanted to do. Um, so I thought, well, let's just go for it. Let's, you know, go to Junt every day and experience all the various classes that they have with art history, um, studio courses. And from then on, I, um, like, as Tom said, he took printmaking and so did I. And, um, I, I like to say I have a concentration in printmaking just because I've taken so many printmaking courses. And um, this past semester, um, we had a big senior art show um, and I decided to use printmaking as my media um, in the show. So I think that Gonzaga helped me pursue my passion for art. I knew I wanted to do it in the beginning, but now I'm very set on, you know, the future and I feel way more confident having graduated with a degree in studio art. But something for me that was super formative was um, 
just in my introduction into printmaking. I, I had taken a little bit in high school, but I didn't know too much about it. And the minute I took uh, my first class with Mary Farrell, who was the former printmaking professor at Gonzaga, um, I just knew from then on I needed to take every single printmaking class they had here. And I did that. And in every course, I learned so much more. And I was able to also share those experiences with other students who weren't studying or weren't getting a major or minor in art. Um, I think it's super cool that Tom is studying biology and chemistry and art and like having that kind of um, almost like a juxtaposition, it seems like, but it's not because I think that it really comes hand in hand. For example, I took um, figure drawing quite a bit here or life drawing where you have three hours with a model who sits for you and you draw them. And Tom and I took a class together um, and there was another biology student in that class as well. And I just, it was interesting to witness other students excel in the arts as well as um, I think having a biology degree as well as learning how to draw the figure comes hand in hand because it's like anatomy. And sometimes if you're a visual learner and learning to draw the bones or the the, the body, the arm and this and that can help with your biology degree too, possibly. Um, so just to wrap it up, yes, I, I think my art degree at Gonzaga like solidified, you know, in me and knowing what I want to do um, and gave me a lot of confidence in prep for the future, so. I can go next because Olivia kind of totally nailed what I kind of my motivations, but it's definitely started as an accident. I was a, I was a biochemistry major originally. Um, I was very focused on the pre-med thing. And then I was drawing and painting for fun and kind of realized that I needed to do it more and wanted to do it more and was starting to see the value of it. And so I switched to biology to give myself more time and then decided to do the art minor so that I could kind of incorporate it into my classes. Um, and it was, I mean, hands down the best decision I could have made in college, I think. And so, yeah, it kind of started as this way to relax and detox from the day and things like that. But then it's developed into this whole thing of this intersection between biology and art. And like Olivia said, in the figure drawing course with Mary uh, Farrell, it was this, yeah, like juxtaposition of analyzing the human body in, in different ways from a creative perspective. And then, you know, going and doing that in an anatomy course, for example, with a very analytical lens. And so, it's, yeah, it's definitely become this really, really awesome way to learn and to think about things. And so, yeah. Thank you. Um, I can also speak on that um, in part because I realized as soon as I introduced myself, I did not say what my majors are. Um, uh, so I'm an English major with a writing concentration and also an environmental studies major. Um, and I knew for like a very long time that I wanted to do English. Um, my dad was an English major um, and I've just always enjoyed writing and always what I was like, I was good at in school. And um, I thought that was good because I liked um, getting A's. So, <laughs> um, uh, but I was kind of like hesitant about um, doing it because I think there's this really kind of reductive dialogue around um, humanities majors that seems to suggest that they're sort of fruitless. Um, and that's obviously not true. Um, and as I was coming into Gonzaga, I knew I was going to go there. I was tossing around all these different ideas for like what I could do in addition to English. Um, because I was so set on like, oh, if I just do English, like everybody's just going to ask me if I want to teach. Um, <laughs> and uh, I ended up doing environmental studies kind of on a whim. And it's been like the most weirdly complimentary um, pairing of uh, majors that I could think of. I just finished up a um, internship for uh, a land a wilderness society, which is like a land conservation um, campaign. And most of what I did was write. Um, and so it was this like this very just like happy marriage between these two things. And so it was cool to see like this passion that I've had since I was very young, which was which was writing in English, um, has all these transferable skills that seem to get lost in the conversation around humanities majors. 
Well, when I came into Gonzaga, um, I really wanted to be a lawyer. I still really want to be a lawyer. And, you know, English, philosophy and Spanish are, are very helpful for developing the skills that will help me become a good lawyer. Uh, but I also feel like as I move through the humanities and take different classes, like I just get to collect passions. And that is like one of my absolute favorite things like music and dance and you know different writing classes especially poetry writing and I just get to have all of these different passions that I can explore in my time at Gonzaga especially since um, going to law school you can you know have whatever majors and and potentially still get in um, so I just I love that kind of freedom within the humanities that I get to pursue all of these things that I really love. And they also help me become, you know, a better lawyer or a better writer, a better person. Thank you. I love hearing all of these stories um, and how you talk about there's either juxtaposition or complementarity in your um, in your education and being able to have that freedom to to choose and to try these things and also to make it part of your curriculum versus just this is something I have to fit in as a hobby. This is part of my life. Why can't it be part of my curriculum? Um, and speaking as a first generation college student, when I told my parents I was majoring in psychology, which is a social science, um, they had the same reaction that a lot of people have about humanities that, you know, what can you do with that degree? And um, I had to do a lot. Of, I had to work on them for a while uh, about like, no, this is so like, this is so useful. It's so cool. And let me tell you why. Um, but to have students be able to say that to each other um, and to have faculty that are supporting that and hopefully families that support that as well in terms of um, creating the well rounded graduate like we want our we want our students to be happy. We want our students to be productive and employable and happy. And all of that is possible. So thank you for sharing your journeys. Um, some of you touched on this, so I'm, but I'm gonna ask this uh, specific question about how making art or writing or you know whatever your creative pursuits are, um, how does that help you even outside the classroom? Like let's say outside of the specific class where you're having to to write for an assignment. How, how do these kinds of activities help you outside of that particular class? Um, I can go first because some um, writing has always been a very important part of my life, uh, but particularly this last year, um, I have used writing to really explore who I am and, and my identity and um, working with, with professors to kind of go through that. And it's just been so incredibly helpful for developing me as a person. Um, and also it's been a way of connecting to other people last semester or not last semester, but in the fall semester, I was at home and this was my first semester of college. And one of the ways that I built relationships was actually through sharing creative writing with other people. We would Zoom and, and share our poetry. And, um, and it's just such a meaningful connection to be able to do that and explore who I am and develop who I am through writing with peers and with myself and with, um, with my professors as well. Um, I, can, I can go as well. Something I've kind of reflected on relating to that is how, especially in printmaking, Olivia might be able to comment on this, but there's a lot of creative problem solving. And a lot of times things just happen and you don't really know why, you don't have really control over it. But then our professors here are constantly saying, you know, no, that's okay, roll with it, go with it, see what you can discover from that, that mistake or from these new things. And so I think that idea of not knowing what to expect, but then finding ways to make your discoveries useful is for me, like what real science is almost about. And I think that in a lot of our scientific labs, in order you know, to make them efficient, we know what result we're gonna get. We know what's gonna happen and it's just an efficient way of learning, but that's not necessarily how real science works. It's a lot of times learning how to use these unintended discoveries to your advantage. And so I think that those skills in like creatively looking at a result and saying, you know, what can I do with this have definitely translated over for me in a lot of ways. And it's something that I hope to kind of hone in and use more in the future. 
So. I think too, going off of that, like with printmaking, there is a lot of problem solving, but something that's so beautiful about printmaking is that it's so process oriented. So you have a lot of structure in it, um, but you still really need to think creatively. And sometimes when those mistakes happen or something, you know, you're lifting up your plate and you're like, what is, what am I looking at right now? How can I make this look better? Or like, what did I do wrong? So like Tom said, there's problem solving, but there's also like, you have to, you know, think creatively constantly. And like in arts and in and, and writing, I'm sure there's a lot of moments where you hit writer's block or art block, or, you know, you lose inspiration in something, but there's always going to be something around you. You just have to be observant and something is going to inspire you to keep going with that project or to continue. And I think having that mindset and taking that into the real world or the greater world outside of college is an important, you know, trait to have. Because I mean, after graduating, for many of us, we're looking for jobs, we're, you know, thinking about where we want to live and, and whatnot. And it's, it's like a big problem we need to solve in a way and, and to think creatively about it in, in ways that are, how are we going to be happy? How am I going to make myself happy after college with this degree? I think that having art in that printmaking um, concept of the process oriented, you know, you can plan your steps out and have an idea of what the outcome is going to be, but to always be open for the unexpected. Um, and the arts have really kind of allowed us to think that way and be okay thinking that way, um, which is a little bit different when it comes to like mathematics or science, when there is a right answer and a wrong answer, which I think is also an amazing thing too. So when you can have both of those, I think you're going to find a lot of success. And I think that's what the arts and humanities really does for us at Gonzaga. Um, if we've got the time, I can absolutely touch on this. Perfect. OK. Um, I think that this year has been like an interesting um, exercise for me, at least in disassociating these like creative pursuits from this like necessity for like professional development or for like career. Um, so the writing that I did for like this internship was obviously very different from like the creative writing or like short story writing that I do more or less on my own time. Um, and I think, um, in years previous, I've had this kind of mindset of it was like career or bust. Like, um, if I can't turn this like creative prospect into, um, into a profession, then it's like pointless because this is like sitting here on my laptop or whatever. Um, but this year, I think my mindset's changed a little bit, um, and that, um, I've realized that there's, there's so much, um, importance in just, in, in, in writing the words down, even, even if, like, nobody sees them, and there's some kind of, like, self-discovery, as Gabriella was talking about, and, um, self-fulfillment in that act, um, uh, it's a very meditative or therapeutic process at times. Um, and so obviously like it's, if somebody knocked on my door and said like, I want to buy your short story or like publish it, that'd be great. But there's less like, I think I'm holding myself to less pressure now because um, there, there seems to be less of a necessity to, um, to, to monetize your like creative output which is good. <laughs> Thank you, all of you. Um, and, you know, as I'm listening, so I'm, I'm hearing different things like, um, you know, there's, there's a value of learning that mistakes are not failures, but mistakes are things that teach us and can take us to the next level in, in whatever way. Um, that through our creative pursuits um, or through our writing, we're learning about ourselves, but we're also learning how to solve problems the, and the unexpected problems, which this whole last year and a half has been just as one unexpected problem after another. Um, so being, but being able to look at that and say, okay, we can do this. We can, you know, we can approach these and we can find the solution. We, it's there somewhere and we will find it. Um, but I'm also hearing, um, what makes arts and humanities special at Gonzaga as a Jesuit institution. And so I heard things like um, 
being able to know yourself um, through your creative pursuits. And so um, sometimes people are like, well, why do we need to know so much about ourselves? Well, um, the more you know about yourself, St. Ignatius of Loyola teaches this as well. We need to know ourselves really well if we're gonna make decisions that are good decisions and that are decisions that serve other people and ourselves well. There's many examples of people making decisions that are not based on a, a firm knowing of oneself um, or a lack of interest in knowing oneself that harms people. And so um, that's a core piece of our education. It sounds like it's kind of threaded its way into your work, as well as learning how to be contemplatives in action and listening for the spirit or listening for inspiration, um, whatever you feel comfortable calling that, to be able to say like, um, where am I being called right now? Or what, you know, what direction am I being called into? And being open to listening for what that is um, and following it. And those are two very um, central pieces of um, the Gonzaga education that you spoke about without me having to ask you a question about that specifically. So <laughs> thank you for doing that. Um, I wanna come back to the faculty and see if you have questions for the students um, before we take a couple questions from the audience based on what you heard from them or comments. I guess I, I, it's so delightful to hear each of you in your own specific paths, but also some of the crossover that Dean Kanye has just been emphasizing. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, I've, I've heard the issue the, the notion of problem solving come up in different ways from each of you, whether explicitly or not. And I guess I'd love to maybe ask each of you to speak a little more, maybe if you had a thought on that in terms of where you feel like that's emerged the most to you. I know I've got a couple of seniors here who maybe are the most aware of that as something that you're taking with you. When I think about what English degrees offer in the humanities, you know, so much of that sense of problem solving comes up and I hear it all the time from recent graduates who have gone out and found that lo and behold, their double major in business and English, that they thought their business major would be the thing that really made them marketable, if that's the word we're use using. In fact, they come back and say, it is all the problem solving skills that I found and, and the creativity of my problem solving skills that's really served me. So maybe I would just kind of bounce the question back just briefly again to any of the students in terms of maybe a particular moment where you were very conscious. I, I know the printmaking was such a great one of, wow, this, I, I, I can see that I'm, 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 I'm solving problems in ways that maybe feel either overt or maybe more subtle. I think I can speak on that lightly. Um, with problem solving and, and printmaking and art, it happens a lot. And I think one thing I wanted to mention before that I forgot is in art, you're always still gonna have deadlines. So you gotta problem solve towards those deadlines. For example, with my senior showcase, um, unfortunately I lost a loved one this semester. So I was out of town for a week and it pushed my schedule back. And I remember getting back into town I had two weeks to finish before my installation deadline. And I was like, okay, how am I gonna do this? I don't wanna have to stay up till 2 a.m. every single night. Like I need to take care of my body as well. Um, and a quick problem solving for me was, okay, I have a whole arm that I need to carve out and do. How about I cut that arm in half? Or you have to sometimes sacrifice minor things so that you can meet that deadline, but sacrifice it in a way where your project is a holistic and it's still going to come out just as you wanted it to. Um, and so that form of problem solving is something that like definitely like comes with art and it also comes with the humanities and science, I'm sure too. And things, you know, you have to do things fast and quick and you learn, you have to learn how to be efficient. Um, which is something that's really difficult sometimes, especially as a young adult <laughs> with motivation, with distractions, with college life and everything. So um, that, for example, was a total problem solving moment for me. <laughs> yeah, but it worked out. So. <laughs> um, I can add just quickly to that. Um, similarly, I think a, a lot of the problem solving for me comes in the form of like optimism and more just being able to look at something and say, you know, this isn't a total mess. Like I can, I can use it. And so, you know, for example, um, one of my projects, the prints weren't coming out clean and I 
was like, whatever, I'm going to take a Sharpie to it. And I spent a couple hours taking a Sharpie to it and highlighting all of the mistakes, but kind of in like an intentional way. And it's actually something I like. And so I think it's not always, you know, it could be planning and planning for efficiency, but it can also be taking more of like an optimistic look at something and saying, you know, what can I do with this? And so that's something I've really found. Um, I can share a quick example as well. I was trying to write a protest poem for an assignment for my writing for social action class. And I had it in my head that I needed to write like the perfect protest poem that like encapsulated everything that I wanted it to say. And I was just so unmotivated. I could not get a single line out on the paper. And I kind of had this realization that like, okay, maybe instead of writing one perfect poem, like you write a whole, like a short collection of protest poems. And suddenly like I was super motivated. I wrote a ton of poetry. I was very productive. And I kind of like took that as a life lesson or like problem solved around the writing block, writer's block in a way where I was like, okay, I need to like figure out ways of putting less pressure on myself, but also to, to, to produce more and to give myself the room to explore different kinds of poems and different ways of writing and different, um, and I think that that's just a, a good life lesson in general. Like you don't have to produce the one perfect thing, like figure out ways of, of producing a thing that accomplishes what it needs to, and it'll probably be better because I think my short collection of poetry is probably better than even one perfect poem. Um, and I can also briefly share, um, I think uh, an example of like problem solving or adaptive like thinking that a humanities focus has um, given me uh, tools or resources for was um, speaking to deadlines, um, but also speaking to um, like technical requirements. So when I was writing for um, the Wilderness Society, I was writing mostly op-eds and letters to the editor, which are very short. Um, and in creative writing, brevity is um, not always a, an emphasis. Um, and so learning to write um, pointed statements in 200 words um, was a unique challenge. Um, and I think that like it was just like this really healthy kind of like dual relationship where like I started to write these LTEs which were obviously kind of uh were like uh argumentative or persuasive writing but they're very short form and then all of a sudden I found myself being way more concise um in my creative pursuits um which was a, a, a great like development um and so I think when you are challenged or you're you're given a set of circumstances that you're not accustomed to um, and you're forced to adapt or problem solve around those things, you'll, you'll find your other aspects of your work elevated as well. And that, that's great. And I, I think the, that whole, um, you know, when I think about who, who do you want, let's say you're an employer and you need to bring on a new team member who is going to think creatively, um, be able to um, even think creatively about the assignment that they have in front of them, um, still meet deadlines, and also have an optimistic point of view and be able to work with the team in this refreshing way. Why wouldn't we want to hire each and every one of you? Uh, uh, just, the, you know, these are skills that anybody would want to have on someone for, you know, for team members. Um, rather than one person who knows how to do one thing really well, but also doesn't bring that team dynamic. And we don't have any uh, representatives from the performing arts here, but that too, you have teams working together, coordinating, listening for each other, timing, um, the discipline of practice, which you, you all like writing and printmaking and other forms of art requires discipline as well. Um, these are all those transferable skills, or I would just call them leadership skills um, that students in the arts and humanities and our faculty members are 
um, encouraging through a creative outlet or creative way um, that sometimes we forget we forget that. But I'm hoping that today that people don't forget that um, as they listen to you. Let's see. So I'm going to look to see if there's a question, but Dr. Parker, do you have a question for them while I scan the chat? And just for our attendees, if you do have a question that you'd like for me to ask the panelists, please put it in the chat for us. I don't really have a question, but just, I guess, a, a comment or observation is that, you know, so much of what they're, they described is really kind of like project management skill which is so applicable in so many fields. And I see it every year with our senior art majors in the senior exhibit where they have to come up with their plan idea for their portfolio and execute it, come up with you know, steps involved exactly as Olivia said, you, know, you have a deadline, things happen along the way and you have to be able to adjust, adapt, be flexible. So yeah. So folks might think, you know, artists are just alone in their studio <laughs> sketching and we're in the printmaking studio, but they're constantly, yeah, engaged in this kind of creative problem solving. And, and I think also a lot of what you described today is um, really becoming nuanced thinkers. And I think that's what you know, Jesuit education is really, really good at doing, um, training students to become nuanced thinkers in a world that is becoming more and more complex, but at the same time, people are having a struggle dealing with those kinds of complexities that we see in our world today. So, so kudos to all of you. Just, you know, wonderful life lessons you're sharing with us. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we also, we want incoming students to hear this too. Like, this is what you have to look forward to. Um, so uh, we do have a question in the chat about, um, you probably have friends, um, who have gone to other schools, not Gonzaga. Um, and so you might have heard them talk about their degree programs or their um, their experiences in college. And so what do you think makes Gonzaga stand out from other liberal, liberal arts universities? And what advice might you give to a prospective student considering Gonzaga? Um, I would definitely say that I really, really appreciated the small classes, the small class sizes at Gonzaga, specifically in arts. And like, although the community feels large, it also is nice and small and you get really good one-on-one, -on -one, like work with your professors and whatnot. And I'm sure in the sciences as well, with the classes being smaller, it's going to, it's a lot nicer and more um, personal with your professors. So. I would definitely agree with that. I feel very like personally connected to, I think every single professor I've had um, at Gonzaga so far, really just, yeah, I love my professors. And then also the emphasis on, on social justice and being um, a person for others and upholding the dignity of, of, um, of everyone is I think incorporated into every single class that I've been a part of um, in the humanities and, um, in music and and even in my dance classes. And that's something that I really value as someone who wants to go out into the world and and work for social justice and um, yeah, and pursue, pursue justice. And so I really appreciate having that emphasis in the classroom. Um, kind of building off of that, I completely agree. And I think being a Jesuit institution, there's this large focus on um, being people for and with others and that kind of thing. And I've seen it in like my biology classes. I never forget Dr. Hayes, the first day of the ecology class talked about why diversity is the most important thing in biology and why it's something like we value more than anything else and how like, of course that should translate to humanity and to everything else. And that's why, you know, like that's why diversity matters from a biological perspective. And so it was even, it was just, there's this a lot of like crossover and the professors really understand that. And like uh, Gabriella said, we have the opportunity to get to know our professors and kind of hear that on a, in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And so I really, I love that, yeah. The fact that like classes don't seem to exist in a vacuum 
is great. And that's kind of what people have been talking about here. I always feel like all my courses within any given semester have been in conversation with one another in some capacity. Um, and I would never want my classes to feel isolated or singular. Um, and they just feel like they have so many social justice applications or, or scientific even applications in some cases. Um, I think I really like the environmental studies program because it seems like this like incredible marriage between humanities and, and the sciences. Um, and every class I've taken within that program has has had equal focus on both of those branches. And so I think just the the scope of all the classes makes this like a school stand out to me. Thank you. We we have a another question in the chat. Um, and actually a little earlier, someone is very happy. Um, it's a Christopher Miller, 100% agree on the lifelong applicability of these skills. Glad to hear that everyone is developing a language to describe this while they're in the programs. Um, and I, I agree with this attendee because I don't think I really understood the value of my liberal arts education until many years later. Um, I didn't like I was practicing the skills, but didn't have a language for them. Um, and the fact that you are able to talk about that now um, is really quite impressive. Um, uh, but we do have another question about, you know, why, why uh, do people choose other types of majors, even if they have an interest or an affinity uh, for arts and humanities? And Garrick, you, you kind of mentioned this earlier, but do you think the cost of the cost of college education impacts prospective students to pursue STEM um, or healthcare degrees versus pretty much all other degrees. And so um, if, if I can reframe that a little bit, just how, how would you advise a student? Let's say you have a friend. Um, or an, a prospective student is like, I cannot major in art or I can't major in English because I have to do a STEM, I need a STEM uh, major to get a STEM career. Like, what would you say, what would you say to those students? Knowing also that I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and I value all of my disciplines equally. <laughs> Um, but, you know, there are sometimes students feel pressure to do something that they don't really want to do because they believe that there's more money or there's some, you know, there's other pressures there. Yeah, there's definitely like a focus on like investment and then um, reward later. Um, and so you see a lot of people will um, kind of spur of the moment choose a, a, a STEM career or a STEM path because there's a financial incentive to do so. Um, I think that there's this kind of like false scarcity idea behind like jobs in the humanity in the humanities. Um, also the idea too that like if you're studying in the humanities you have to have a job that is like directly tied to those studies. Um, my dad was an English major and he is a fire chief now, which doesn't seem to quite correlate. Um, so, and I think one of the overarching themes of this conversation has been what skills are we developing that are transferable to other, um, to other fields. And um, so I would just say to those students, um, if, you, if you have multiple passions, that's great. And if you can find a way to double major, I highly encourage it. I think English complements or any humanities program like really complements other degrees in such a like wonderful way. Um, but if you're really just passionate about a humanities degree and that's something that you wanna explore, like go for it. Um, and you'll probably discover more things as you start to study. Um, and you might discover other passions that you have, other um, outlets that you'd like to express yourself through. Um, Long and short of it, I think there are jobs out there. Um, I, I came in pretty like apprehensive um, and which is normal and it's completely rational, like, like normal to feel that way. Um, 
But at, over the course of these two years, I feel like I've started to see that there are more options than I was believing there were when I came in. Would it be okay for me to jump in, Dean Kanyo? Um, I just want, I think, Garrick, your comments resonate with me and conversations I have with students regularly. And I'm thinking about, Gabriella was talking about passion early on, sort of collecting passions. Um, so, I mean, I, as, a, as a faculty person imagining a conversation with a prospective student that I've had, um, I think that sense of finding something that you feel passionate about because you will learn so much more deeply when you're working in your passions. I think that's something that is so valuable. And then the other part, which Garrick articulated so nicely about, you know, we're talking about transferable skills also feels, I mean, Shalon was just talking about project management. And I think um, it is an interesting false narrative that somehow the humanities or the arts don't prepare for the workplace. Um, it feels like everything everyone said this hour has articulated in so many ways how much that's not the case. And I, I think about ways that I've heard from so many of my recent uh, former students who are working in all kinds of fields and they come back and say, you know, it's interesting. People tend to think that there's all these quantitative skills that we need to get in college. So that, that sort of maybe sends us towards STEM. But the truth is that every field, including data analysis and the sciences um, need qualitative um, attention. And, and that qualitative perspective that I think the humanities brings is, is such a huge part of that. So um, I guess I just wanted to piggyback on Garrick's remarks. I think that passion as well as um, all the different kinds of ways that being a communicator and a problem solver, um, having a way to frame new questions is, is something that can be brought into, into you know, kind of illuminate every field. Um, and if I, if I can put a, a plug in there too, is this piece of um, the small class sizes and the individual attention and the, the quality advising and our and also our career and professional development office, all of those other supports for students help um, be able to tell the story and craft your own, per like here's my path through my Gonzaga education here are all the things that I learned and that I can speak about um, as as real skills and 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 I'm a healthy human being like I'm you know I'm a I'm a well rounded person for having gone through this. Um, all of that matters um, sometimes in intangible ways like you can't qualify like it's hard to say. Uh, you know how do you qu quantify a well-rounded person but but to be able to say that um here are all the things i bring to my family to my community to my place of business you know wherever wherever you enter you're bringing this whole um this whole person experience with you um i think that's of great value um and you're right like it's much better to find your passions now and to know what you like and don't like and what you, you know, what you're good at versus being forced to do something that you really don't have an interest in doing, but you feel compelled to do it. And then 10 or 15 years later, you realize what had happened. It's like you get to do that now and really find out now. So you are getting um a very strong foundation for being sent out into the world and i think that's for a lot of parents and caregivers that's what we want for our children um is that strong foundation so thank you um i see it's one o'clock so i'm gonna turn it back to jeff and see what he'd like to say thank you so much for uh to all the panelists for sharing your experiences i really appreciate it Thanks, Dean Kanu, and thanks to the students and our great faculty. Um, very admirable to see the quality of, of our students and our educators here at GU. Uh, it, it, great day, great conversation, and the importance of what we're doing as well-rounded citizens is, is clear. So really appreciate that. 